Hello, my dear friends. Today we will read the memoirs of a German soldier, which are breathtaking in their extreme cruelty. Matthias Schenk was born in the border region of Belgium, which was annexed to Germany. He served as a demolition engineer and by will of fate was among the infamous SS Stumberge de Durlewanger, known for its severe atrocities during the suppression of the Warsaw Uprising in August-September 1944. It is widely considered to be the most horrific punitive unit in World War II history. The Durlewanger Brigade, also known as the SS Sturmbrigade de Durlewanger, or the 36th Waffengrenadier Division of the SS, was formed in 1940. It was hardly possible to recognize Poland, which had been defeated a year earlier, as conquered. There were underground groups in the cities and partisans in the woods. That is when Gottlieb Berger, who was one of Himmler's deputies, put forward a proposal to form a special unit dedicated specifically to fighting partisans. He also came up with a candidate for the unit, his old friend Oskar Pol Durlewanger. Named after its commander, the unit was made up of convicted criminals who were not expected to survive service under his command. In Durlewanger's unit, the soldiers wore the SS uniform with no rank insignia. Due to the fact that they were convicted criminals, and it was only at the end of 1943 that they were given the buttonholes. Durlewanger expected unconditional obedience, and after the smallest misdemeanor the offender would be beaten. They were punished in the same way as in a concentration camp. Durlewanger executed people without any fair trial for disobedience. The principal requirement of Durlewanger was blind obedience to the commander. Bearing in mind that Durlewanger himself was an amoral, violence-prone personality, he scattered victims of war crimes along the path of his unit. Before suppressing the Warsaw Uprising, his unit wreaked havoc and destruction in the Soviet Union. The Durlewanger Brigade was involved in large-scale operations, always honored with the highest commendations from the operations commanders. Many times Durlewanger himself went to the attack in the first line of soldiers and personally executed even men who hesitated. The unit not only participated in military operations, but also carried out the missions assigned to them specifically. Durlewanger's Jaegers tracked down partisans, determined their locations and bases, here is where their poaching experience proved useful, attacked partisan groups marching, and carried out punitive operations. The following are only some emotionless reports on the results of the battalion's operations. Two partisans and 176 suspects were executed. One partisan and 287 accomplices were executed. Every village suspected of being sympathetic to the partisans was annihilated with its inhabitants. Durlewanger constantly requested additional equipping of his unit with flamethrowers. In total, Durlewanger's unit burned down over 180 villages with their inhabitants. Sometimes, even if a village was not annihilated, the livestock was taken away, farm buildings and fodder were burned, and the healthy people were captured for forced labor. In the fullest sense, there was a dead wasteland left behind the Durlewanger Brigade. Before we turn directly to our story, I want you to be warned that this has not been censored. There are many depictions of terrible atrocities of the Durlewanger Brigade. If you are under 18 years old, or if you cannot tolerate such horrible reports, it is recommended to refrain from watching this video. Well now, let's get started. I was 14 years old when the Germans came to our village in 1940. The region of Eupen Malbendy is located in the German-speaking part of Belgium. In 1919, it became part of that country. But after Hitler occupied Belgium, it was annexed to the Reich. Even as a child, I knew the road crossing the border. We were helping German Jews to flee to Belgium, smuggling food across the border. In October 1943, I was drafted to work for the Reich, and half a year later I was drafted into the army. It was a hot day on August 1, 1944. We were lying on the hay that covered the floor of the car and listening to the sound of the wheels. All of a sudden, some splinters fell from the wooden walls of the car. We heard shouts and blood was shed. Someone is shooting at us! Bloody hell! They've taken us to the Russian front! Then we saw a soldier running towards our train across the field. There was blood on his face. The uprising on Warsaw is on! That guy was shouting. We entered Warsaw, marching on the cobblestone streets, and the Poles were shooting at us, but we couldn't see them. We took by storm house after house, and everywhere were dead civilians with holes in their foreheads. Then we fought our way to the SS barracks, and a company on trucks nearby jumped out right into the Poles' positions. Several trucks were on fire. The soldiers fled in different directions. Some of them ran straight into the Polish gun emplacements. Our sergeant was shot and killed a few steps away from me. 
The following day, we got orders to take the road and started to make our way to it through some gardens. Our Lieutenant Fells pushed us forward. Then we caught heavy fire from some building. We blasted the doors with grenades and rushed into it. The Poles attacked us. There was a quick knife fight, and we pulled back, hiding in the bushes. Four of those men I had once shared a railroad car with were killed. Fells led us into the attack again, but the Poles had a good position and camouflaged themselves. We hid all night in these gardens like frightened beasts. We were unable to pull back further because the Poles were shelling us from the rear. I was so thirsty. All the time we had to be under fire. The next evening the infantrymen came to rescue us, but we never made it. Then the SS came. They all looked a bit strange. Their uniforms had no insignia, and they were all drunk on vodka. They immediately rushed into the attack, shouting, Hooray! Dozens of them were cut down by enemy fire. Then a tank showed up. We moved forward, followed by the SS. A few meters away from the building, the tank had been hit. It exploded, and a soldier's kepi flew into the air. Again, we rushed back. The second tank was slow to engage, so we were in the front line while the SS forced the civilians out of their houses, pushing them closer to the tank and getting them on the armor. It was the first time I had ever seen something like that in my life. They forced a Polish woman dressed in a long coat, a little girl in her arms, to the tank. The men who were already on the tank helped her to climb onto the armor. One of them held the girl in his arms, and at that moment the tank moved forward. The little girl fell under the tracks. She got squashed. The woman shouted terrified, and then one of the SS shoulders shot her in the head. The tank kept moving forward. Some people were trying to escape, and the SS men were killing these people. But the attack was successful. The Poles retreated. We came after them. Behind our backs, civilians began to come out of their cellars with their hands up. They were shouting, Nice partisan! I couldn't see exactly what was going on as we were fighting with the Poles, but I heard the SS commander, dressed in a leather cloak, yelling at his men, ordering them to kill everyone, including women and children. Chasing the Poles, we entered one of the houses. There were three of us. We were on the first floor when the Poles attacked us from the second floor and from the basement. There was darkness and we were setting fire to the furniture to see things. From time to time, there were bayonet fights. At daybreak, I realized that there were two of us left. The third guy had his throat cut. When we went back to our positions, dead Poles were lying everywhere. We had nothing to do but go over the dead bodies. That fanatical moron Fells greeted us quite friendly. Where the hell have you been, you cheeky pigs? Then he started complimenting the SS for their valor. But I couldn't even eat. We all felt so sick inside. Already in the barracks, I found out that the big SS officer was actually Oscar Derlewanker, and his soldiers were criminals freed from prison. We used to call him the Butcher, but in hushed tones, since in his units the road to the noose was very short. He used to hang people every Thursday, whether Poles or his own men, for no reason at all. He often himself knocked the stool out from under his victims. After a few days, we ended up under Derlevanger's command. There were three assault demolition men, Sturm Pioneer, for each SS platoon. It was our task to clear the way for the attackers, to blast obstacles and doors. We were constantly on the edge of the attack. We would run up, plant explosives, and after the explosion would run into the house. We'd enter houses and kick the inhabitants out. The Durlevager hordes followed us. They all looked like vagabonds, filthy and ragged uniforms. Not everyone had guns. Some of them picked up weapons from the dead. They were given vodka every morning. We sappers also got vodka. We used to drink it on an empty stomach because it was not accepted to eat before an attack. You can survive if your stomach is empty, but if you get shot in a full belly, you will die in agony. Derlevager was moving ahead behind the attackers, sometimes in a tank or under good cover. His job was to push the men forward. The ones who lagged behind, he shot them in the back. Usually it was enough to have a crowbar to break down a door of a house. We used explosives or a bunch of three grenades to break down stronger doors. One day I was planting explosives under a heavy door somewhere in the old town. There was a voice from behind the door. Night Scheiben! The door opened and a nurse appeared in front of us with a tiny white flag. We went in with bayonets fixed and saw a huge hall with beds and mattresses on the floor. All around were wounded men. There were wounded Germans besides the Poles. They begged the SS soldiers not to kill the Poles. A Polish officer, a physician, and fifteen Polish nurses surrendered the military hospital to us. The Durlewanger men came in after us. I managed to get one of the nurses hidden, but then we were ordered to leave to guard the building. It was after the war that I found out what happened next. The SS men had killed all the wounded. They smashed their heads with rifle butts. The wounded Germans were screaming in terror. 
Then the SS soldiers switched to the nurses. Their clothes were ripped off, and we heard the women squealing. In the evening, there was a roar in Adolf Hitler Square, now Pilsudski Square, as if it were a boxing tournament. I and my comrade climbed the wall to see what was going on. There were soldiers from different units, including the Wehrmacht, Kaminsky's Cossacks, and the Hitler Youth Kids. They whistled and yelled. Durlewanger stood with his guys and chuckled. The hospital nurses were led through the square undressed naked with their hands behind their heads. The blood dripped from their legs. The doctors were dragged behind them. All of them were pushed to the gallows, where several bodies were already hanging. When they hung one of the nurses, Durlewanger himself knocked the bricks on which she was standing out from under her feet. I couldn't bear to look at it any longer. We rushed back to our position, and on our way, we saw Kaminsky's Cossacks pushing civilians somewhere. We used to call these guys Cossacks Hiwis, Hilfsvilliger, volunteer helpers. A pregnant Polish woman fell to the ground. One of them turned around and hit her with a whip. She attempted to crawl away on her knees, but these guys trampled her with the hooves of their horses. Our guys died, and others took their place. I was probably just fortunate because when Fels sent me into battle, he wished me to die a death of a dog. Our demolition squad was called Himmelfart's Commando, ascending to heaven. For we were the first to move under the Poles' fire coming from unknown directions. One bullet whizzed by you and you were in heaven. They fired at us from the rooftops under the slightly raised tiles. Many of them fought in German uniforms and could speak German fluently. We couldn't even put on our helmets because the Poles wore the same ones. We were simply afraid of being shot by our own men. I was promoted to the rank of Gefreiter. This promotion was given automatically after fifteen hand-to-hand -hand fights. Each of these fights was registered in my soldier's book, and even Fells once noted my valor. There was a note in the front-line newspaper, Das Weichselblatt, informing about the fact that Gefreiter Schenk succeeded in liberating captured German soldiers. The way it happened was as follows. I was just preparing to blast open another door as I heard someone's voice, Don't shoot! The doors opened and about thirty German soldiers stepped out. They were crying with happiness and kissing me. They told me that the Poles had captured them, but treated them good. That was the time I was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. One day we blasted the doors of a house. I guess it was a school. There were kids standing in the hall and on the stairs. Many kids. All of them had their hands up. We stared at them for some time, until Durlewanger came. He ordered us to kill them all. The SS soldiers shot everyone, and then went right over to the bodies and smashed their heads with rifle butts. The blood poured down the stairs. At present, there is a memorial clock at this place, which says that 350 children were killed here. I think there were many more, perhaps 500. Whenever we stormed the basements where the women were, Durlewanger's soldiers raped them. Multiple times groups of SS soldiers raped the same woman while keeping their weapons in their hands. One day after the battle I was standing against the wall and shaking, not being able to cope with my nerves. The Durlewanger men appeared. One of them found a woman, a pretty woman. She was quiet. The soldier raped her, pressing her head firmly against the table with one hand, holding a bayonet knife in his other. Then he cut her blouse open and then slit her body from her stomach to her throat. First time I was sent to a penal company because I put on underwear found in one of the basements instead of underwear provided by the state. Second time I got in trouble because of a priest. We blasted the door to a monastery, and two of us entered the basement. The priest stood in front of us. He had in his hands a communion cup and a prosphora. I guess it was some sort of impulse. We got down on our knees and took communion. Then a third guy from our squad came in and did the same thing. Then the SS broke in, and there was all the usual shooting, screaming, and moaning. The nuns were treated in the usual way. A few hours later we saw the priest taken by Durlewanger's men. The SS men were drinking wine from a bowl. The prosphoras were scattered on the floor. They were pissing on a cross that was leaned against the wall and torturing the priest. The priest's face was bloodstained. His sutan was torn to shreds. We snatched the priest out of their hands and handed him over to my battalion. But I heard nothing more about him. Afterwards, however, I got an extra duty and was sent out as a sentry to guard the bridge. The bridges over the Vistula were blasted, but there were still spans on some parts. I was forced to stand day and night on the bridge remnants and observe the Russians. The night was quiet. Some shooting broke out occasionally, but it was mostly into the air. The enemy was too far away. In the daytime, the Russians moved along their shore pretty carelessly. I don't remember the moment we made up our minds to kill that pig Fells. All we wanted was to stay alive, and he pushed us forward constantly. There were seven or eight of us. We put our rifles together. Two of them were loaded, and took it in turns to pull. 
When an opportune moment came and Fells was ahead of us, he was shot in the back. He fell and we ran away. The new commander turned out to be much more tolerant. I can't recall today which building we stormed that day. It was probably the National Bank, and we were unable to take the building for a long time. The next day, the Goliath, it's a remote-controlled tankette for blasting obstacles and fortifications, was delivered. It was directed towards the building, and civilian poles were forced to go ahead of it. They covered the Goliath because we knew that the rebels had learned how to blow up these tankettes when they were already on our front line. Many of our soldiers died in this operation. The Goliath blew up and made a hole in the wall of the building. Then we chased the poles around the basements and floors of the building all night. By morning our tank arrived and the building was captured conclusively. In the basements, the floors were strewn with many gold coins. We stuffed our pockets with them so tightly that our pants fell off. Then the gold disappeared. The guys talked in whispers that Durlevanger had taken it away somewhere. I remember my final fight in Warsaw. We were assaulting some building and I had to dash across a field. I ran across a wounded soldier lying on the ground and gave him some water from my flask, then continued running to place a bomb charge under the door. The SS men advanced behind us. When I came back, Durlevanger stopped me and jabbed his finger toward the wounded man. Did you give water to that pig? Just then I noticed a red and white armband on the wounded guy's German uniform. Shoot him, Durlevanger said, and handed me his pistol. I froze, motionless. It made me sick. Durlevanger was so furious I couldn't even understand what he was yelling. One of Durlevanger's SS men grabbed the gun out of my hands and shot the pole. Durlevanger yelled that he was going to shoot me on the spot. Then several Wehrmacht soldiers approached, and he began to threaten to put me on trial by court-martial. An infantry officer engaged in a furious argument with him, but I, meanwhile, simply ran away. I only remember the heavy battles starting on August 6th, as they happened one after another, but I don't remember the dates. I recall that on September 15th I was looking at the opposite bank of the Vistula River and spotted a Russian tank, then a second tank arrived, then a third. They approached the bank and we got panicked. Our positions were in sight of the Russians, but they didn't fire. Then the tanks vanished between the houses. In late September, the last rebels capitulated. A great number of people surrendered to us. All the wounded men were taken into a large warehouse, and we were ordered to leave. We heard screams and gunshots already from a distance. I knew what had happened. Then it was time to retreat. We managed to get away from the Soviet tanks and avoid falling into the hands of the SS, who hung the deserters on trees. We abandoned almost all our weapons, got rid of our belts and helmets. Some of us were wounded, but kept it secret because we were afraid of being left behind by our fellows. The Ivans followed our footprints, which we were leaving in the deep snow. I was exhausted, my strength ran out, and I settled down in a ditch at the edge of the forest. I had on a white camouflage coat, like those worn by the Russians. I was found by Polish peasants. Soviet? they asked. German? I nodded. Poor boy. Are you hungry? The tallest of them asked me in German. They dragged me into the house. I was scared. I had been taught in the army that Poles were sly and devious. As a young woman appeared in the kitchen carrying a large knife, I figured that they were going to stab me to death. Instead, though, she cut up my boots, because she couldn't take them off. I had my arm and leg broken, and I was severely frostbitten. They gave me hot milk. This is how I found myself on the farm of the Berzhevinsky brothers, in the village of Ochoza. I started calling Ignacy father and Wincenty uncle. They called me Matus and kept me hidden in the stable where they had three horses. They explained to the Russians who came to sweep the village that I was the seriously ill son of the owner. Why did they save me? I'll never know. I guess it was out of mercy. I had the look of a beaten kid. I left the village in June 1946. The way home took me three months. I passed through Polish roadblocks and an American prison camp in Berlin. I was taken by Belgian gendarmes to Brussels to be interrogated, but no one seemed to be interested in me. I had no papers, and anyone would have recognized this guy as a Belgian. In the 1980s, I arranged food and clothes shipments to Poland and visited Warsaw again, where I met with veterans who had participated in the uprising. One of them told me that he shot at the last train that arrived in Warsaw on August 1, 1944. Concerning the fate of Durlewanger, he was detained in the town of Altshausen by a French patrol, arrested and jailed in the local prison. The guards at the prison were Polish men. They knew who Durlewanger was and had no intention of forgiving him anything. Neither the Polish partisans executed nor the fallen participants of the Warsaw Uprising. 
During several nights they took the prisoner out into the corridor and, as it is called, unburdened themselves. The last night before they had to be replaced by a new guard, the Poles smashed the head of the over-executioner with rifle butts. That is all for today. Remember to leave your opinion in the comments. Bye everyone. See you later.